thanks for the introduction, Joe. Um, so yeah, I'm the Learning Threads Coordinator, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the design thread um, throughout the, our MEng degree at Imperial, but focus particularly on um, a new module that we have in year one to try and prepare students, uh, particularly for the use of digital design tools. So really this is kind of there is a subtitle to this so sketching and modeling um, is the module that we've introduced and these are kind of my reflections after three years of running this um, so we've had two on-campus experiences and one online cohort and i just want to acknowledge um, two visiting design fellows um, who are absolutely instrumental in helping me run this module. So Vladimir Marinov um, is director of Define Engineers, so a company he set up himself having worked um, in various digital teams beforehand. Um, and Fernando Madrazo Aguirre um, is currently based at Cowi um, and is very involved in their bridge design team there. So this, I think, is one view that students have when they arrive with us in first year. So this is the sort of what they may have been told about um, engineering. So essentially, engineers take a problem, they apply a process, and they arrive at a solution. And obviously, we, I feel, need to explain to them that it's a lot more involved in that. Um, and actually, you know, there are these wicked problems out there that are actually very difficult to define in the first place. So at the other end of the scale, I have seen this sort of diagram presented as the engineering design process. So it's very chaotic at the beginning. Um, and somehow through a sort of engineering magic, um, we end up again arriving at a sort of converged solution at the end of this. Um, and what we want to do is, is provide them with something um, between these two extremes, if you like. So very early on, we introduced this and anybody who saw Will uh, Dubbin's presentation yesterday, um, thanks Will, we didn't pay him, um, but you know he showed this diagram as something that we share with our students very early on. So it has echoes of the Engineering Council's um, double diamond design process, um, but you can see here, we have a sort of initial stage, you know, where we have motivation, feasibility, concept, um, and beginning to define, if you like, the problem. Um, we then have this stage where there's ideation, communication, qualitative, and quantitative judgment. So this is where we're sort of beginning to, you know, reduce that chaos down to something um, that we can actually deal with. And obviously in civil engineering, we generally would have a construct. Um, having heard the sustainability talks, you know, hopefully this might actually be a retrofit or something rather than always constructing new. And then finally, we have an operate phase. And between all of these phases, there are clear opportunities for learning and feedback loops and so on. Um, so initially, when we started thinking about both the thread, but also this sketching and modeling module, we sort of thought, well, you know, where does digital feature at the moment? And unfortunately, we kind of came to this conclusion. So it was pretty good for quantitative judgment. It was definitely used to communicate. So very often the design had been done. There was a need to transfer that into AutoCAD or something like that. Um, a need perhaps to run more complex models to demonstrate certain features and so on. Um, and obviously there's a need during construction to um, communicate all of this information between different stakeholders. But what we really want, I think, is to develop to the point where actually digital tools are used throughout the design process. So particularly when we're in this kind of ideation phase, you know, we want to be able to use digital tools to allow us to increase the solution space rather than simply being a transfer from the analog to the digital world to allow communication. Um, I've deliberately sort of not indicated what happens during motivation and operation. I think there are probably um, plenty of discussions to be had there, but obviously we would like for digital and analog to feature hand in hand um, throughout this design process, essentially. So 
A um, couple of slides just briefly explaining how sketching and modeling fits into our um, English degree, but also um, giving some of the motivations for the introduction of the design thread. So in year one, we now have sketching and modeling. So this is the first um, sort of item that the students encounter. Um, Mike Cook and Sunday Popola, um, people may be aware of led our creative design for some years now. So in year one, we have two creative design weeks um, and we also now have a construction week. In year two, we have two further creative design weeks. So these are intensive weeks when no other teaching is going on um, and the students, you know, um, actually develop a lot more of their own briefs. So they take a kind of initial idea and run with that now. Um, and obviously in year two, we also have the construction area. And then finally in year three, we have our intensive six week group design projects um, alongside industry. And we've introduced um, an idea of a reflective design portfolio. Um, so I really like the matrix in Peter's presentation. Um, and I think perhaps that's something we'll seek to include, but it's really sort of trying to give our students an opportunity to reflect on what they've done, um, hopefully reflect on the progress they've made, but always to kind of see, you know, what went well and what could they improve between each of these exercises. Um, so how does a design thread fit into the MEng degree? So a while ago, um, several of us involved in design teaching sat down and essentially defined these four domains. Um, so we want to know sort of what knowledge and understanding our students have. And obviously, you know, Imperial and lots of other universities, there are, you know, very intensive um, technical courses um, that cover lots of concepts here. Um, threshold concepts, I think, of a great deal of interest. Um, and also for me, this idea of informed innovation. So basically, the greater your technical knowledge and understanding, the more likely you will be able to reach the extremes of a solution space. Um, we also want our graduates or our students to develop skills. So communication, collaboration, challenge, critique, convince, create, connect. Um, you know, these are all things that we want our students to be able to do. Attitudes is, I guess, one of the most difficult areas to work on, but we would like our students to be curious, committed, respectful, reflective, and resilient. And I think actually, although, you know, attitudes maybe would be viewed as a bit more inbuilt, um, I think what we need to be very careful to do is to set learning um, outcomes that actually allow us to reward these types of attitudes. So, you know, curiosity, um, can be rewarded, even if curiosity doesn't always result in success every time, for example. Um, I've just mentioned um, these are three books by an American artist um, that I happen to think capture this sort of creative process um, quite well. Um, you know, and I, I do encourage our students to have a look at these. Um, you know, so this idea of sort of stealing um, from what other people are doing, using that as inspiration, but remixing it. Um, showing your work, I think as engineers, we're often very bad at showing our thought processes. Um, and actually as educators, we're often not very good at showing our thought processes either. And then finally, obviously keep going in terms of this idea of resilience. Um, and the final area is the experience. So what can we really offer students? And I think in civil engineering, we often have a particular problem because, you know, you might be lucky as a practicing engineer to be involved in, say, five or six projects, um, you know, during your working life. Um, and that's not the case necessarily for other engineering disciplines. So we really want to give them the experience of designing it, making it, breaking it, and then hopefully doing it all again. Um, and we have 12 thread level intended learning outcomes um, that we share with the students related to all of these domains. So um, again, we'll talk about it, but this is overall what we're aiming to do for our graduates. We want them to have a very good depth of knowledge, um, but obviously 
you know, it's more about learning how to learn. We don't necessarily want them all to have the same depth in each discipline. We just want them to know what it is to experience a depth of knowledge and how you might sort of judge where you are in different technical disciplines. But we want them to have breadth. So we do want them to have diverse interests and influences as well. Um, and the sort of square that I've drawn around this T-shape is really to try and emphasize that I think the design space that we operate in is dependent on these two parameters. So the breadth and the depth of these T-shaped people uh, that we're hopefully producing as graduates. So on to actually developing the sketch in modeling module. So we essentially had an opportunity to replace quite a traditional drawing module. So it had covered sort of hand drawing, you know, hand technical drawing, different views and so on. Um, and then it had introduced AutoCAD. But in our view, it was very much, again, this process of having had the ideas and basically done the design was sort of getting the design down in a more formalized way. So we wanted both analog and digital design skills really to go a lot further back. So towards that kind of initial ideation and even the initial motivation. So we set these three simple intended learning outcomes. So we wanted the students to end up at the end of the module to feel confident in using sketching and modeling to think, collaborate and communicate. We wanted them to feel confident in using computational tools as part of the engineering design process. Um, so I don't think it matters exactly what those computational tools are. It happens for us that they're Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, and obviously, you've already heard them mentioned today. And then finally, we do want them to be able to develop and iterate design details and processes using sketching and modeling approaches. So we have some challenges. Um, so we have really quite a large um, intake in first year. So this year we may have 140 students, but we almost always have over 100. Um, we found in practice that arranging them into groups of four to six works quite well. We obviously have limited time. So people have talked about crowded curriculums already in this conference, um, and we really wanted to maximize what we felt we could get done in 30 hours. Um, and obviously we're a central London university, so we have limited space. We have no dedicated design studio where we can allow students to sort of leave models and so on up. There are some other challenges. So curriculum inertia, um, I think affects all of us to some degree. We were worried actually that the students themselves might have a bit of a fear of failure or this idea of wasted work. So if you didn't immediately get something that was kind of brilliant, um, you know, that had you wasted the time getting towards that. And also this sort of idea is actually a lot of our students, you know, they, they really want to do the technical stuff. Um, and I guess they find a lot of comfort in being able to do that and, and reach kind of predefined solutions. So actually this idea of, you know, can play be work, I think does uh, play on their minds and also probably the minds of some of the academics um, at Imperial. So, you know, the three of us got together um, and we decided that what we wanted was we wanted one artifact type that could be used throughout. So we didn't want to be chopping and changing. We wanted something that could be easily made, thrown away and remade. So we, the idea that ideas were cheap, we wanted to get across um, and actually you could, you know, even get quite a long way through a process, but dump that, reflect, learn from the good points and then come up with something new. And we wanted something that had rules that could be translated from the physical analog. Um, so basically from physical models um, into a virtual domain without requiring too much specialist knowledge. So obviously we did have to introduce the software to the students. So we had plenty of discussions over coffee um, and a few beers, and eventually we decided on this idea of pop-ups. So um, the next slide just shows the first year we ran this, and you can see you know, the students really quite deep in concentration trying to get to grips with what the rules of pop-ups are. So you know, if you put a cut in and then you put a fold in, how do they interact with each other, basically? So, 
you can see in this slide, which explains how we've approached the actual running of the module, a little bit of this idea of interweaving. So each group of four to six is broken up into subgroups. Week one, we have a general introduction to everyone. Then subgroup A experiences the analog side and in a parallel session, subgroup B experiences the digital side. Then we swap after an hour. And then finally, we get back together after another hour to have an initial reflection. Weeks two, four and six and three, five and seven are actually very similar sessions. So the session run for week two and week three on both the analog and digital side are quite similar. But what we do is we obviously swap the subgroups between each of these. Um, and we found that actually this works really well. So we bring the students back together um, for an hour at the end of each session. Um, and we ask them to reflect, you know, tell your partners what would be helpful for them to know in advance of this session next week. You know, what are the things that you perhaps missed and really want them to look out for? Um, and then we have at the end of week seven, an initial submission and peer review. We have critiques in week eight and nine, and then finally we have an exhibition in week 10 with this submission there. So we really have this idea of interweaving analog and digital throughout parallel workshops. So I'll go quite quickly through the submissions, um, but I just wanted to emphasize one thing. So something that we found very effective is this idea of construction instructions. So that really breaks down um, you know, how people are going about developing this, but also we've introduced this idea of pseudocode. So basically telling us how they're going from the physical world to the digital world. Um, and we just emphasize there are no right and wrong ways of doing things. And we're assessing the ability to develop and communicate a design rather than particular aspects of the design. The final thing just to mention before I go through the sort of um, example slides is the peer feedback. The peers are assessed on the quality of their feedback. Um, the groups aren't assessed based on what the peer feedback says. So this is submission one, and we can see a particular group developing their designs, the construction instructions, and then finally this digital pseudocode approach as well. For the second submission, this is really building on that first part. So they need to produce a variety of versions of their pop-ups and actually assemble these into an artifact. So again, we have two sets of construction instructions, the sketch pseudocode, but also some reflection here as well. So again, I'll show the same group. So you can see their thinking has developed a little bit between the two submissions. Um, their presentation, I would argue, has improved a little bit as well. So we do talk to them about this. Um, and I, I should emphasize that all of this was done this year remotely. Um, so they perhaps didn't have all of the facilities available to them. Um, but you can see that actually the explanation, I feel, is really good. So I feel that I could, you know, go away and make this myself. And I think that's what's most important really, is they're learning to communicate the design process, but also here actually a construction process. Again, we have you know, the design logic, how do we get into the digital world and also actually other advantages from being in the digital world. Um, and obviously this group went to a bit of effort. So they tried to explain you know, how this might look in a cityscape. Not all of the designs echo this, but I think it was hopefully useful to you to see the how one group has evolved. So in their reflective statements, I won't read everything on this slide, but I think what's interesting here is they have picked out key skills from the hand sketching, so from the analog environment that's helped them to do the design, but also later on, they've picked out these key skills actually from using Rhino and Grasshopper. And, and for me, this is the really important point is they were able to create digital versions of the pop-ups, so that's good. But by experimenting with different parameters in Grasshopper, they were able to push their design further 
and evolve it past their initial sketches on paper. And, you know, for me, that means we're succeeding to a large degree. Um, they also reflected on the engineering design process flowchart. Um, again, I won't present all of this, but it was really interesting to me that they're now picking up on how other modules actually feed into the design process. Um, so this is something that we tried out this year, um, and it's been really successful, I think, at helping students understand how their teaching um, shapes everything that's going on. So changes from cohort one to cohort two and three. Um, we spent more time, first of all, presenting. Um, we got feedback that actually we present far less. We let them get on with things far more. Um, it works really well into weaving things and having analog and digital introduced in parallel. Um, so teaching in subgroups and then getting the groups to discuss and reflect works really well. We introduced an additional week one structured reflection um, that actually helped us understand whether things we were doing or that we could do slightly differently to help student learning. So I really recommend getting that reflection and communication between um, staff and students early. Um, initially, we had a lot more deliverables, so we consolidated these into two submissions. Um, student feedback, anonymized and allocated marks, I've mentioned that. Um, the assessment criteria allows for sort of failure as long as they can explain and reflect on how they might address that. Um, design critiques are mandatory, but are non-assessed. Um, and then finally, you'll notice I haven't really talked about moving online, um, and it's because it didn't really affect things very much. It, you know, we were surprised by that. So final slide. So reflections on all of this. So civil engineers are creative. I, I just don't think it's a debate that we need to have anymore. You know, people are creative when given the opportunity and the framework. The module challenged the students, and I think that's a really important point. We should be challenging students. You know, that's what they're in higher education for. Um, students are really good at giving feedback and reflecting when given the opportunity. And we know that the students continue to use the skills gained from this throughout the design thread, but actually also on other modules within the degree as well. I would really recommend, you know, work with alumni, they're your assets. Um, and also, so for us, research students are our teaching assistants. Um, so really kind of discuss what you're doing with them beforehand and get them sort of involved properly as part of the teaching team. Um, we learn at the same time as the students, and we're very happy to share that with the students. I think sometimes, you know, it can be a bit uncomfortable becoming the guide at the side rather than the sage on the stage, um, but I really recommend it. It's, it's more rewarding in my view. Um, it is okay to remove things from the curriculum to add in new things. So I think that's a really uh, sort of important point when we know we have crowded curriculums. Um, and finally, I would just say that, you know, this idea of setting subjective intended learning outcomes, it can be a little bit uncomfortable, but I'd really recommend it. And then thinking about, you know, how are you going to assess these? Um, very quickly, um, this is our YouTube channel um, and the exhibition that I mentioned the last three years are up there in different forms. Um, I don't know whether the QR code will work for everyone, but hopefully you can just go to um, that website. So it's YouTube forward slash C forward slash Civeng Design. Um, and just thank you for your attention. I know I've run right up to my time, but thanks very much.